Hi, welcome to Pixel Lives. My name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of Wet Pixel, and um, I'd like to thank Inon or Inon very much for sponsoring this episode. Obviously, quite an iconic manufacturer, particularly of um, strobes and flash guns, but also have a wide range of accessory lenses and torches and other products. Please head on over to inon.jp to check out what they do. Um, and I'm joined by a regular contributor, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hey, good to see you, Adam. Nice to see you too. Um, what have you been up to? You've been diving? I suppose not. None of us uh, have been. Have no, really. no, I haven't. No, but yes, yeah, lots of underwater photography stuff going on. So that's been nice. And I've, I have finally had the time to post some images up on social media, which has been good. So nice to be able to share some underwater good. pictures and have some time for processing. Don't have to tell you off anymore. Fantastic. So um, today I thought we'd talk about, we thought we'd talk about housing buoyancy. And I thought I'd ask Alex whether he likes his housing to be positive, negative or neutrally buoyant when he's diving underwater. Well, I think um, in terms of talking about buoyancy for photographers, before we get the housing right, yeah. um, and I think loads of photographers fuss about their housing and don't fuss enough about themselves. Yeah. And, I, you know, and I think there's, you know, I dive with lots of very good underwater photographers, you know, many of them award winning. And some of them are absolutely fantastic divers. And some of them continually dive incorrectly weighted, incorrectly buoyant. And I think it's it, it's really quite widespread in that. I think people, when they start off in, in diving, they put quite a lot of effort into getting themselves neutral. Mm. But then they kind of get used to diving at a particular weight. Mm. And it's very, very common that I think, you know, that a lot of, you know, more experienced divers dive heavy all the time. And I'm sure you, you know, particularly all the training you do, you see this a lot. Yeah, I think there's a sort of common, there's a common thread that, you know, if you dive overweighted, you know, you can get underwater. So that's okay. Whereas obviously if, if you're underweighted, then you can't get underwater and that's going to, you know, cause problems with your dive. But, but actually, to be honest, as a photographer, I think both are equally bad. We should always dive correctly weighted. And, and, you know, this will often mean that you need to invest the time and effort into getting yourself correctly weighted at the beginning of a trip, at the beginning of a dive season or however you divide things up. Obviously, every time, you change environments every time you change your exposure protection you need to then look at what weight, weight you're wearing and adjust appropriately and it's a really really important part of the process and something something we really should do at the beginning of every trip and I, I must be honest I very rarely see people doing it so so it probably means we're not doing it um, I, I think for me as well it, it's also about you know dropping weight through a trip yeah. you know particularly if you're diving in neoprene wetsuits which most people are they compress, you know, on, on particularly on longer trips. And, you know, I, for example, one of my more recent trips, although it's quite a while ago now, was to the Philippines. And I started that trip with four kilos um, mm. in a five mil um, suit. Mm. And by the end of the trip, I was diving on one kilo on the same suit because mm. the suit had compressed a lot with lots of diving in a relatively short period of time. It had lost a lot of buoyancy. Mm. And I was noticing that I was just getting heavier and heavier on the dives. And I was I think the key thing is to keep dropping weight because I really like to dive, certainly in the tropics, without ever putting air in my BCD. You know, yeah. if I can avoid it, I want to be neutral in the water. I don't want to be having to pump air in when I descend. I want to swim down to get away from the surface. And when I get to the bottom, you know, I'm I'm pretty neutral. Now, I dive with very little lead. Yeah. And, you know, I regularly dive in the tropics without any lead and with an aluminium um, cylinder. But that's because I'm chunky. Um, you know, if you've seen my my legs in a pair of swimming trunks, you'll understand why I don't need a lot of a lot of, a lot of lead. Um, S- but saying it's not that, about numbers, it's about getting it right for you. Yeah, and so, saying that, I think there's a t- tends to be a, t- a temptation. People often say I'm very buoyant, or you know, I'm I'm. But in actual fact, people don't float. You know, when when you you've got to imagine yourself in a swimming pool in your swimming trunks in your swimming costume. Um, do you float or sink? And most people are pretty much neutrally buoyant. Um, if you then say, well, I'm going to give you put a two kilo weight belt on in in, in the swimming pool, what happens? Is that most people say, well, I'm going to sink like stone. So you know that really is. So then. Most people only need the weight that they need to offset whatever their suit floats them by. And as you say, that will change over time. And certainly the sort of skin type suits, the fourth element thermoclines, those types of suits, you know, they're neutrally buoyant. They don't actually have any buoyancy characteristics. So, so again, so, so they I don't change buoyancy during a long trip. No, they don't. No. I love mine is that, yeah, yeah. you know, you get your weight right early on and it stays right all trip. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, the reason I wanted to stress that point is I think that I'm constantly asked by photographers who fuss over the buoyancy of their camera. Yeah. And I wish sometimes that underwater photographers also fussed over their own buoyancy because yeah. it would actually help them with their photography as much, if not more, 
than get, uh, getting their camera right. So yeah, that, that's kind of why I wanted to derail you briefly on yeah. the subject I know you also feel strongly yeah, yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. So is it really essential to have a neutrally buoyant underwater camera housing? Well, it certainly helps not to have a camera that's a long way from being neutral. You know, yes, it's really nice if your camera is trimmed and you can just let go of it. And when you turn back around, it's still exactly where you left it in floating in midwater. Yep. And there is kind of that feeling that, well, if it does get dropped off a boat or for some reason you have to let go of it in an emergency, it's not going to float to the surface or sink to the bottom very fast. That is also quite a nice feature to have built into the system. Yep. Is it essential? Absolutely not. We all took very nice pictures long before things like buoyancy arms really were proliferated in underwater photography. Yeah. Um, but is it convenient? Yes, it is. It definitely makes the whole process more tiring. Yeah. Um, one thing I would just say briefly, though, about getting too fussed about it is that buoyancy arms in particular add a lot of drag to an underwater camera system. That's yeah, true. Yeah. And um, I think that's something worth considering in that by making your camera usually more neutrally buoyant, it does make it harder to move around and move through the water. Yep. And I think you just need to, to to weigh those things up in thinking, oh, it must be neutral. But actually, if that means it ends up really swollen in size, particularly on those long sticking out arms that when you twist and move the camera, create a lot of drag and a lot of resistance, then maybe actually you need to think about actually how important is the neutral and how important is the maneuverability and the tiring nature of this. I, I, I would say, obviously, we're coming primarily from a photography background, but if we were talking from the shooting video background, so you're a you're a photographer who takes some video, um, then actually I would say that neutral buoyancy is critical because the way you get yes. those silky smooth shots, the way you get that, you know, you avoid the whole seasickness effect of, of the camera moving up and down is by getting the, the housing trimmed off and, and completely neutral. So, mm -hmm. so possibly we should put the proviso, if you're going to shoot video, make it neutral. Um, if you're going to shoot stills, it's less critical. Yeah, I think that's... Yeah, that's a really important point. Yeah, very good one, Adam. Um, when I used to dive with, with Peter Schoons, who was the, the BBC's top underwater cameraman for, for many years, yeah. um, certainly you know a decade or two ago, um, yeah. sadly, he, he died five, six years ago. Um, he would, his big underwater camera, you know, film camera, was completely neutral and he had a small plate on the bottom of it that he would slide forward and backwards yep. so that he could not only have it neutral he could trim it at different angles for different shots so he would work out the angle he wanted to shoot that particular shot move his trim weight yep. so that it sits not only neutrally in the water but either nose up nose down or completely horizontal yep. and, and and he would do all that before actually shooting the sequence yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and that gave him that consistency to get those really high quality images so I think I think for me, when I'm shooting wide angle, um, I tend to try and get my housing close to neutral. I say I'm not a great video shooter, so so for me it's not. But I like to have a housing that's relatively neutral. I'm I'm kind of a um, so I I will invest a bit of effort in trying to get it fairly close to neutral. What about you, Alex? For wide angle, do you shoot neutral or? Yes, I, I'm the same. Um, I, I, I my housing fairly happily falls to neutral and i've never really put lots of fuss into it mm. but my housings are actually generally very neutral when i use a big dome port so usually on a full frame camera the 230 nine and a half inch dome port yeah. um with my normal strobe arm setup of, of, of a double arm on each side with buoyancy um foam on those arms yeah. and that leaves me with a housing that is actually very very neutral yeah. um and i have to say that it's slightly fortuitous in that you know, those arms are kind of full of float arms. I couldn't put more on. And the only way I could have less uh, would, would be to cut them in half. And I would never bother doing that. Um, and again, it's with that dome port. But I like that as a, as a starting point. It means that the camera is um, is nice and easy to handle. It works well. I um, actually sometimes in, in, in the Red Sea, in the Rex, I trim it slightly. I sometimes will take off a buoyancy piece mm -hmm. because when I'm setting up remote strobes, I actually prefer a camera that just sinks slightly. Mm. A neutral camera starts to float around and inside a wreck, that mm. expensive dome port can easily start bashing into things and yep. getting scratched. So um, sometimes when diving in the Red Sea, particularly because the Red Sea is a little bit more buoyant because of the thing, you do notice that slight difference. I sometimes take a chunk of buoyancy off each arm. So if you see a photo of me diving normally, I have five float arms on the two arms on each side. If you see pictures on the Red Sea, you'll often see me just diving with four. Um, and that's because I just, when I'm going in a wreck, I like that wide angle to be to be slightly negative. The 
I think it's the reason I like the wide angle to be neutral is it's a type of photography that you're doing much more free swimming. You know, yeah. whereas macro, you may well be steadying yourself more. Wide angle, you're you're usually free swimming, and quite often you're out in the blue shooting subjects. And I have yeah. to say, when you're out in really you know deep blue water, having yeah. a housing, you know that if you happen to drop for some reason, yeah. isn't going to suddenly start sinking really deep. Yep. or floating up to the surface and risking getting lost yep. is actually a real reassurance. Yep. So not only does it make it easy to handle, yep. um, it also it also works for that. I think there's a couple couple of other points that I think both Alex and I, most of the time we're shooting wide angle, have fairly big heavy strobes as well. And they're part of your buoyancy system. So so bear in mind, you know, as you vary strobes and you go from a, a smaller, lighter strobe to a bigger, heavier strobe, that's going to affect the buoyancy of the housing too. And, and both of us use quite big heavy strobes for wide angle most of the time. So... Yeah, but I think most of the strobes are pretty close to neutral. The yeah. big ones tend to have more air in them. I suppose, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's kind not, of the same yeah. with housings, really, is that, you know, people often see a big housing and go, gosh, that must be hard to handle underwater. Often, yeah. And actually, yeah, the, the bigger housings are often, you know, actually easier to get neutral because yeah. they've got, they displace a lot of water and therefore yeah, actually yeah. are more likely to be neutral. They're cameras that tend to be heavy. And it's, pro I don't know about strobes, but it may well be the same. Yeah. Is something that's smaller that's got everything packed into a small space more dense, yeah. can actually yeah can actually end up being more yeah. negative. Yeah, it makes sense. I think you know certainly there is a demand for smaller housings, but obviously smaller housings will tend to be more negative. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing I was going to mention is for wide angle. One of the things that 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 I will often do is I will often be using slower shutter speeds than I would be. Yeah. Um, Shooting macro, I mean, I, I might for macro, I might creatively use slow shutter speeds, but typically. So again, by using, by getting the housing trimmed off and neutral, um, it does help me because I'm not supporting the camera in the water, and, and you know, it's supporting itself. And so I think I find it more critical for that as well. So, all right. So, so macro then, Alex. What do we do with macro? Are you are you positive, so, negative, or neutral? So for certainly for muck diving trips, I intentionally want my camera to be slightly negative. So that it will, you know, and the reason for that is actually I love the way it trims me. If you dive with a slightly negative camera on a muck dive, it tilts you around your, your center of buoyancy so that you end up sort of head down and with your feet up in, in the air, which yeah. is, is ideal for getting down to the level of the subject matter without having to impact on the seabed other yeah. than perhaps with the camera itself or, you know, or, you know, maybe a pointer stick or that sort of thing. And it keeps your legs up in a way so you're not kicking up sand, you're not destroying visibility for yourself and, and for others. Yeah. So I, I purposely, certainly on a muck diving trip, like a negative system. Now, strangely, um, um, Simon Buxton, who, you know, um, well known as the um, owner of, of Nad Lembe Resort, mm. um, he likes to shoot macro with a positively buoyant housing. Mm. And I have no, and I've borrowed his housing off him when staying there to try, to try one of the lenses he had. And I have no idea why he does it, why he likes it. it uh, it's it's horrible. <laughs> um, it completely messes you up. I think, it, and, um, you know, and it's purposely positively buoyant, you know, um, but that's how he's comfortable. So there is personal preference in this, but definitely for muck diving trips, I like a negative housing by a long way. I um, I, I trimmed my housing off slightly negative with a, with a doctor lens on it once and, um, and then took the diopter off for some purpose. Um, so now I've Put the camera behind me, thinking it would stay put because it was negatively buoyant. It floated off, so <laughs> I then had to rush around and find it, which was, um, yeah, fortunately I did. So yeah, um, so so yeah, I'm I'm exactly the same. I like a slightly negative housing, um, and and in fact, in the, in the example I've just given you actually was probably probably it's a bit too positive. It shouldn't we shouldn't be relying yeah. on the weight of a diopter to hold it on the bottom um, to hold it down. But and exactly the same thing. It keeps my feet up, keeps my head down. Yeah, but but, yeah, yeah. So sorry, you're gonna say probably saying the same thing as me. Yeah, so so that's on a muck diving situation where 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 um when I'm diving over a reef, so shooting macro on a reef or um shooting fish portraits, for example, I, that then I my my requirements change. I still want to be that sort of head down, feet up position to keep my feet clear of kicking and the thing. But also I'm I still want that. So so I would tend to add a little bit of buoyancy back on. For, for those types of situations. Um, how about you, Alex? Yeah, no, it, it, I'm, I'm the same. It, it's when I, I do quite a lot of fish behavior photography, mm. fish portrait photography, particularly in places like the Red Sea or the Cayman Islands, you know, in those reef environments. I, I tend not to be kind of really into super macro in those destinations. I'm much more of a, a fish portrait person in those places. Mm. And in those destinations, I like my camera rig to be as neutral again as possible for macro. Mm. Now, actually, what tends to take care of that naturally 
is that type of shooting with a macro lens demands slightly bigger strobe arms. And it's yeah. just really the extra buoyancy of putting the longer strobe arms that have more buoyancy on them. Yeah. That is often enough. Yeah. Um, I used to always, well, I, I, and I, I used to always use a buoyancy collar as well on the port yeah. for that type of shooting. But now I tend to only use that buoyancy color when I shoot with the um, the Sigma 150 mil lens because yep. that lens is a big chunk of glass off the front and it always makes the housing very nose heavy. Yep. Um, and so when I use that that lens, I like to use the buoyancy collar, which just just helps stopping the, the camera getting very nose heavy. And this is all about comfort for me when I'm shooting. A yep. neutral camera to shoot fish portraits, you're generally going to shoot fish portraits hovering in neutral water. So if yep. your night's neutral and your camera is nice and neutral, you can just stay very still. And the less you move, the more relaxed the fish are, the easier your autofocus works and, and all those things all together. So yeah, yeah, it makes a big difference to me. So yeah, sometimes it won't see color, but it's, it's often just taken care of with just the extra longer strobe arms. You suddenly put, you know, three or four more chunks on because you've got longer strobe arms and, and, it, and it, it takes care of itself naturally that way. So that, that's probably a good place to sort of start talking about how we get our cameras trimmed off. And, mm. um, and so the first thing, obviously, the obvious one, we talked about chunks of buoyancy. Um, these are mm. the obvious things. They come in all sorts of different brands, shapes and sizes. Um, uh, the foam is not that easy to get hold of in that it is quite difficult stuff because it's relatively incompressible. So um, it is available, but people say, I'll just get some foam from get some pipe lagging or whatever and that tends not to work to everyone it is it is it is special stuff um yeah so so um so no, and it's a good point because when you see it on someone else's housing you think oh yeah you could just go up and squeeze that like a sponge yeah because it looks like a sponge but actually when you touch it, it it's kind of totally incompressible yeah and, and I, mean, I, I think that it's not quite as easy to source as people imagine it might be um yeah, sometimes so you use fishing floats as well kind of the floats from nets um but they tend to be brightly colored yeah. And in general, I think if you're wanting to be relatively stealthy with subject matter, you don't want bright colors all over your camera rig. Yeah. Um, but, but some people, you know, are quite relaxed about that because there's plenty of fish that aren't going to care because they're bright color too. But um, I think it's it's good to go to a more neutral color. So the, the first thing is chunks of buoyancy on your arms. That's an obvious sort of, and I, I'm sure anyone who's hung around photographers will have seen, will have seen those. Um, Alex mentioned a, a buoyancy collar. This was a particular product that was produced by an American company um, whose name escapes me now, um, but um, that actually attaches around the, the macro port um, and has a series of float sections as well embedded in it. Um, and, and it's a specific one. In general, I think they fitted a variety of macro ports and um, certainly most um, underwater camera retailers will be able to source them, know where they are. Um, yeah, no, also people have made, made their own very easily as well. It's, it's, it's quite an easy thing to produce to add a buoyancy color. Um, a, another source of buoyancy um, trim is when your housing is a bit too positive. Hmm. And this particularly happens if you have a large acrylic dome port, yep. which are very buoyant. All that air in them makes them float up and it gives your camera a lot of torque wanting to twist itself strongly upwards and yep. it can be very painful after a day of shooting um so not only is the buoyancy of the housing a, is a pain but that movement so the solution for that is people tend to put weights on the lower edge of their dome port on the lower shade yep. on the outside just to weight it down and one of the most common solutions people find is they find the the balancing lead for car wheels yep. um, when you're balancing a, a wheel um which are pieces of lead with adhesive glue on the back and you can just peel them off and put them on there and, and it really can help trim out your housing. I the bet downside you. of that is you are increasing a little bit your travel weight by yeah. doing it. But I think most people generally are very happy that they've done it because of the. Um, yeah, I actually use a bit of Velcro. So I've stuck a bit of Velcro on the bottom shade of my dome port and then I stick Velcro onto the sticky parts of the wheel. And that allows me to adjust it a little bit, obviously going from fresh to salt water, for example, which mm. um, sometimes is nice. But. Um, yeah, certainly that's a that's a common thing, and and I mean I think this. I is don't a, worry with my glass domes though. I have to say it's only on acrylic dome for me. The 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 other thing that I I thought um, you know is we're we're assuming here obviously that housings are um, inherently positively buoyant, so we're or, or inher inherently um, sorry inherently negatively buoyant, so they're tending to sink. Um, Obviously, if you've got a housing that's tending to float, that can be an equal battle. And you may well find that you need to add weight in different ways. Certainly, the, some of the, um, the resin um, 
compact camera housings were very buoyant um, and you know they actually came with weights you could attach to the bottom of them to weigh them down Olympus ones used two years ago um, so you know it is a situation where you may actually need to add some weight depending on your housing system um, in order to get it trimmed up in order to get it uh, relatively neutral. So um, the final thing I wanted to mention um, for me is when I shoot split level photography I do sometimes add additional buoyancy to my housing if I have it with me so that my housing will trim itself and sit nicely at the surface. It, in an ideal world, I would love to say that I always trim it to have it exactly sitting perfectly at a half and half position. But in reality, I don't do that. I, in reality, I just put as much buoyancy as I can on it to at least get it at least partly out of the water. You need a lot of buoyancy to lift them up. Yep. Um, in the past, I've made um, a pad out of a swim float. Um, and I've just drilled through two holes in it and I can just bolt it onto the, the, the threads on the bottom of my housing and that help floats it up. I tend to also use those big Popeye, I always call them Popeye arms, mm. Popeye, the sailor man, he had those big arms, um, those big Popeye, those really heavy buoyancy arms. Yeah. I'll often take a couple of those purposely on a trip and use them to trim when I'm shooting split levels to help maintain the camera at the, at the surface. The dome tends to float, but it tends to tip the camera this way. Yeah. So you set those off behind the housing. You know, you have one straight arm section with no buoyancy on and then the Popeye arm sitting down behind the housing. Yeah. That'll help float the housing up to, to that level. Yeah. yeah, keeping the buoyancy in the water is important, isn't it? Otherwise it doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't work. Yeah. No, wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Lots of good information there. Um, no problem. So, um, Alex has been working on his imagery so we can see it all on social media. Where's the latest lot been put, Alex? Yeah, Instagram. I've been um, yeah, finally had a chance to process some pictures this year. So I put some new pictures up on Instagram at um, Alex Mustard One. Fantastic. So go on over there for your for dose of inspiration. Um, and thank you very much, Alex. Um, thanks very much again to Ion for sponsoring this episode. Um, the sponsors are very important. They allow us to keep doing this, these um, episodes. So thanks very much. Um, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Please feel free to add any comments in the comment section about how you achieve buoyancy with your housing and drop us a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again soon.